Well, here we are uh, approaching the end of another year, and right now in America, we are rolling in options when it comes to having fun. We, we are the most entertained generation ever, and yet we're also the most depressed. Now, we got more conveniences and more anxiety. We live in a beautiful country. It's enmeshed in ugly words and enormous confusion right now. But the good news is as believers, we're citizens of another kingdom where God rules and the joy is so big that it can't be measured. In fact, David describes it in Psalm 11, uh, 16, 11. He says, in the Lord's presence is fullness of joy. 1 Peter 1.8 calls it glorious, inexpressible joy. He's saying it's so magnificent, it defies description, but you guys are actually experiencing it. He's t telling this church, even though God's joy can't be measured or described, it can be experienced. It's like an astronomical event. You know, we see these things, uh, you know, from telescopes, and uh, we can measure, you know, what's actually happening out there, but it's just too much to wrap our heads around like uh, this solar eruption you're about to see. I get an idea of, of the scope of this thing. They added that little blue ball up there, uh, which is the size of the earth. And, uh, and that it takes about 30 earths stacked end to end to measure this thing. I mean, that's, that's the enormity. NASA says it's 237,500 miles long, and it's releasing energy equal to 100 million megaton bombs. I mean, my brain can't even relate to that kind of power. In enormity. But the same God who created that fireball in two trillion galaxies, tri two trillion galaxies, created you. He knows your name. And James said, uh, Jesus says, rather, he loves you. He, he, he loves you with an everlasting love. And when you compare human love to God's love, it's like a birthday candle to that solar explosion. I mean, it, it, it's... Even though we can't begin to measure it, God created in every one of us this craving for it. We hunger for a love that is so enormous and intense, only God can satisfy it. That's why we get addicted to things like drugs and pornography and food and all kinds of other stuff, good and bad, trying to quench that gnawing appetite, that hunger inside of us. We're always needing more. Taste of food, you know, it's, it's wonderful, but then it's gone. Music is delightful, but then it stops. The movie's two hours of laughs. And on the way home, we're already back to worrying about work. But we got options. We got Netflix and Amazon Prime now to fill our nights and weekends with all kinds of possibilities. Some of us seem to be on a mission to watch them all. But it's never enough. The gnawing always returns. Because here's the source of our problem. God made our five physical senses to enjoy our physical world, but not to satisfy our hearts. That was a huge statement. All the partial fleeting pleasures of this world are meant to point us to Him, where we can be fully and forever satisfied. Here's how it works. It starts with the new creation. Jesus became one of us. He became a human. He lived a sinless life and then died on a Roman cross so God could judge our sins in his sinless body. So God could, can now be right in making us right and giving us a new heart and putting his spirit in, it, in us. God can be totally righteous in forgiving our sins because he judged our sins once and for all in the body of his only son. Listen to what Jesus said in John 7, 38. He said, whoever believes in me, read this with me, Rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Now, that is a massive statement. Jesus says the major sign that a person is born again is this living water, this river of living water they've got flowing from the inside. He, he, he makes it clear it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus summed up his earth mission here in John 10.10. 10. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the what? Full. John 15.11, he said, these things I have spoken to you, read it with me, that my joy may be, remain in you and that your joy may be full, maxed out. 
Now, that is in red print in every Bible, but what do we do? We still go looking for joy in all the wrong places. And it's not a new thing. Back in the Old Testament, God makes this statement in Jeremiah 2, 11. He says, my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. The heavens, and he's referring to the angels here, he said, are are shocked at such a thing. They shrink back in horror and dismay. They go, what are you people doing? You know, they're, they're... In dismay, for my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. Now, a a cistern was something any Israelite would understand immediately. It was a a word picture that they got clearly. Uh, It's a, a, a... A cistern is a reservoir that you dig out of the earth or you cut into a rock to store water. And uh, the reason this was a vivid picture for them is very few natural springs uh, existed in Israel, and they have a very long dry season, which made cisterns vital to their survival. And anybody knew a broken cistern was worthless. I mean, a cracked Rock can't hold water, so they, they got this in spades. I mean, this is, this is clear as a bell. They're, here's what was happening. In Jeremiah's day, many of these people had abandoned God to worship false gods. They had even built altars to a detestable god called Baal, which, uh, on which this, this idol, they would offer their children as human sacrifices. It was horrible. They took part in ceremonies that included prostitution and pagan temples. I mean, we're talking major idolatry, debauchery. Now, this is God's chosen people doing this stuff. And yet they're, you know, involved in all this kind of craziness, basically digging broken cisterns of idol worship and immorality. Now, imagine yourself in a, in a desert. You're dying of thirst, and you come across this crystal clear spring that is uh, flowing, the water is pure, it's right in front of you. Instead of drinking from it, though, you turn around and hack out a hole in the ground to try to catch some rainwater. That's the ridiculousness of this. I mean, it's crazy. But God says, that's what you're doing. When you try to fill that vacuum in your heart that was shaped and built by me, for me, with stuff, alcohol, drugs, sex, gambling, porn, name your addiction, you're sacrificing your relationship with me for a temporary high with a huge downside, and all the while, I'm here, I'm right here, and you're, you're looking at what you need, what you want. I'm here, I'm, I'm here for you. He calls those things idols. He declares them evil. But God doesn't give up on us easily, and he's incredibly long-suffering. He's He has Jeremiah there telling him again and again and again, you guys, if you continue going this direction, if you continue to reject God, he's going to withdraw his protection. You're going to be enslaved by an enemy nation. Bad things are on the horizon. It's coming. It's coming. 20 years, you know, 20 something years, he warns them, turn back to God. You know, maybe you'll be merciful, you know, before it's too late. All they did was ridicule him. All they did is persecute him. And then finally the day came, the hammer fell. The Babylonians attacked their city, and I mean, they destroyed the place. They, they uh, destroyed the temple, leveled the city of Jerusalem, marching tens of thousands of them back to Babylon as slaves. Seventy years pass in their slavery, and, but God never forgets his people. During this period, the Persians conquered the Babylonians, and God moves the heart of the new king to let the Jews go back home. And the Old Testament book of Nehemiah tells the story of their return to rebuild their lives. First, they, they start with the temple, and then uh, years later, they rebuild the walls around the city. And, and this is all, you know, we're just going through this pretty, pretty quick. This is a very interesting story. But Nehemiah 6, 15 says, The wall was finished in just 52 days after we had begun. When... A, Our enemies and surrounding nations heard about it. They were frightened. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. These are the bad guys who had ridiculed and threatened to kill them. And now they're terrified because Israel's God had flexed some major muscle here, helping them to accomplish this impossible feat in just a few weeks. But repairing the broken wall was obviously phase one. I mean, God's ultimate 
idea here, a recovery plan, was to reconcile them, to rebuild their broken lives. It's always his top priority. He's, he's always after our hearts. Well, if people go home after this, you know, what was that? You know, it's like, whoa, what did we just do, you know? But they can't stop thinking about it. They, the whole thing was miraculous. Now they're fascinated to know more about this God of their ancestors who's helped them do this impossible thing that, you know, had so overwhelmed them for so many years. And, you know, there's this tug in their heart. We, you know, we need to go back to Jerusalem. We need to, I want to experience that closeness I was feeling to God through this, this whole ordeal. And, and, you know, the Bible tells us God comes close when we're stressed and hurting. And, man, they had experienced it firsthand. And so suddenly this spontaneous thing happens. They, just six days after everybody goes home, they all come back to town. And what happens next is another miracle. They all gather in the town square, and they, go, and they get Ezra, the, the high priest, to come out and to tell them about God. So he takes out the scriptures and starts reading it to them. And we're talking Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the books of the law. You know, the Fred begat Harry, who begat Methuselah, begat, you know, it's like, whoa. And, the, and, and when you cut the calf open for sacrifice, take the guts and do this, you know. It's like, ah. And they're listening from early morning until noon. They're listening to all this. And for six hours, as they're standing there listening, they are weeping. They're, the whole crowd just weeping, repenting of their sins because these people didn't have Bibles. I mean, most of them are hearing this for the first time in their lives, and suddenly they are gripped with how far they've been out of God's will, how, how far away from God they've been. And this is the God who's just helped them rebuild the walls, and so they're you know, thinking, oh, man. It's like going from a dark room into midday sunshine. I mean, it is blinding. It is painfully clear to them why they're suffering. Well, obviously, look at what we've done. The cause of all this destitution and misery is the fact that we turned our back on God. We're go we were going our own way, and it wasn't an accidental foul-up. I mean, this was deliberate rebellion. started with their ancestors, and they're seeing it now. It's what Jesus is getting at in Mark 7, 20, when he said, it's not the outward stuff, because that's what we always think. We think, oh, you know, I, I just, you know, like everybody else, I just felt Jesus, no, no, no. This comes, this is what comes from the inside. This is, this, this is the stuff that defiles you. It's what comes from the inside, from within, out of a person's heart come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. We look at our brokenness. You know, we look at all the negative stuff we're going through and think, yeah, but, you know, mostly this is happening because of my lack of opportunity. You know, I just was born on the wrong side of the tracks, wrong family. It's my dysfunctional upbringing. That's the problem. Pro Actually, it was genetics. You know, my mama's side of the family, just all hotheads. I, get, that's what gets me into trouble. No, Ron, I'll tell you what it is. It's it. What, what it really is, it's this president we've got. He and that last president ran us into this ditch. You know, that's, what, that's, that's what's going on. It's, it's this economy. Jesus says, no, <laughs> your problems go way deeper than that. This mess you're in, this is self-inflicted. There is no leader who can fix what's wrong in America right now. I mean, we need a heart transplant, all of us. I mean, we are, th this is us. All this rage and divisiveness and racial hatred, it's all coming from within. I mean, I, I, it'd be wonderful if we could blame it on some politician or we could blame it on somebody, but it's us. And until we hear God's word, we don't realize it. We just think, oh, yeah, if they get the, their act together, we could make America great again. You know, we, we, we are totally oblivious to what's wrong and why things are going south until God opens our eyes and shines his light on. Psalm 119, verse 130 says, the teaching of your word gives light, so even the simple can understand. Psalm 36, 9 says, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. When you, when you get some bright light happening in a room, you know, we're getting 
to that time of year where the sun shines in differently. And in my basement room, you know, I got some windows there. But it, typically during the summer, it's kind of at an angle. Right now it comes in, it's like, this place is it filthy. You know, look at the dust bunnies under there. And my goodness, you know, there's dust all over the place. Suddenly, what you thought was perfectly clean is a mess, you know? And in the light of God's Word, that's what happens to us. We can see what's wrong with our lives. It's painfully obvious. This is not your problem. This is my problem. I'm the one doing this. That's why we come together to hear His Word taught every week. It's to keep the light on. We don't want to be deceived. Jesus said one of the big things that's going to happen in the end times is deception. People are going to, you know, be deceived in all kinds of ways. Has, have you noticed how much the things that used to shock us don't anymore? I mean, we watch TV and just think, oh, well, you know, live and let live. I mean, it's not that they stop being wrong. It's not that anything has changed as far as God's concerned. It's not that these things aren't damaging us. It's not that they're bad. It's this we've just gotten used to it. You can learn to drink scalding coffee if you stay with it, but it'll carterize your tongue and your throat to the damage you're doing, still doing damage. So this is why I encourage you guys, stay in church. I mean, it's going to be so easy to compromise in the days ahead. The big trap the enemy is setting is to keep us cocooned in a padded web of entertainment where we don't even want to leave the house. And that's already happening. I mean, that, that thing you got on the wall, that's about to get 10 times cooler. I mean, it's going to be holographic. You know, it's going to, it's going to be so enveloping and, and we're going to have, you know, l l uh, virtual worlds that we can operate in and live in and walk in and it's going to be just so easy never to leave the house Hebrews 10 25 says and that let's read this together read, read this with me off the screen and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do but encourage one another especially now that the day of his return is drawing near now, I know some of you are thinking well you're harping on this a lot listen our records show that most of you only come uh, a couple of times a month, if that. So you're not going to be able to walk in that little light in the days ahead. I'm just telling you right now. We, we, when It's going to be way harder to pull yourself away from the TV set to get here. It's, it's just going to get harder and harder, guys. For your sake, for the sake of your children, you know, get your kids here. Be, make coming to church every week a priority. I know, I know it's, it's a pain uh, uh, sometimes when the, you know, it's dark outside still, and, but you go to work, and this is way more important than you going to work. I mean, this is way more important to your spiritual development, your spiritual health. Uh, get here for communion every month. We're doing communion this, this Wednesday night at 7 here in the main room. I'm going to be leading. This is a priority. This is so important. If we want that frozen lump of hamburger called our heart to stay soft and warm, we've got to keep it near the bonfire of God's love and the word and the truth. And we've got to keep the light shining in our lives. So here's what happened in Nehemiah's day. I'll get off that. All, all that light produced weeping and genuine repentance. Second Corinthians uh, 7 10, Paul uh, the apostle says, that's a good thing. That kind of sorrow is, is what, you know, God wants us to experience. It leads us away from sin to repentance and results in salvation. When we realize, you know, we've gone our own way, we refuse to follow God, I mean, it should cause us grief and shame. James says, weep and howl. I mean, uh, get on your face before God and repent, you know. That kind of sorrow is a good thing if it produces repentance. If it causes us to humble ourselves, to confess our sins, to seek God's forgiveness, to change the direction we're headed. But Paul says there's, a, there's another kind of sorrow. There's worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, and it results in spiritual death. It takes us away from God. It digs us in a deep, dark hole of guilt and self-recrimination and despair. Maybe you'll recognize it by the Bible name. It's called condemnation. It's sorrow without repentance. And it drives us away from God like it did Adam and Eve. 
in the garden. You know, like, don't talk to us now, God. You know, we're, we've, we've done wrong, you know. But Paul tells us in Romans 8, 1, he says, look at this. Let's read this. Oh, this is such good news. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, here's, here's, here's the good news. Well, now we can repent and let it go. That's the good news. There's a point where we say, all right, I'm done with this. No amount of penance is going to fix me. It's not going to fix the mess I've made a thing. I, I have to stand right back up and receive God's forgiveness and kick the devil out. You know, forget it. I'm done guilting myself. I'm not going down that road. Romans 5, 17 is God's word for me. I have received the abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness. I reign in life through Jesus Christ. I'm forgiven. It is written, Romans 8, 2 says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. I will not go on punishing myself for a sin Jesus paid for. I receive the gift of righteousness. The payment is, has been made. This is the truth about me. I am God's beloved. He delights in me. I have been made righteous and pure and right in his sight. Now, just for the record, yeah, just for the record, that's how David related to God. I think that's why God calls him a man after his own heart. He says, this guy gets it. This guy gets it. I mean, his psalms of repentance, I think Psalm 51 is one of his main repentance psalms. He goes to the toenails, oh, God, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. But then he gets right back up, and he says, all right, I'm still your beloved. You love me. You delight in me. I mean, it's just uncanny, the, ability, the, the way this guy would just, you know, change directions. Well, after about six hours of weeping here, they're, they're standing there listening to the law, and they're weeping. Nehemiah says, all right, enough. Now it's time to party. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, you talk about shifting gears. That's like going 100, 100 miles an hour and going, okay, kick it in reverse. <laughs> you know, it's like. What? What? Wait, give me some time here. <laughs> Calm myself down. And he says, no, no, no. He said, enough. Six hours is enough. Go and celebrate with a feast and share gifts of food with people who have nothing to prepare. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do you know that's where that verse shows up? Isn't that interesting? The joy of the Lord, guys, is your strength. That's Nehemiah 8.10. In a nutshell, he said, guys, look, God's never given up on us. Look around you. This wall is proof. See that? That was God before you even knew the law, before you even recognized how far off you'd been. He is so full of compassion, so gracious, so faithful, so ready to forgive us when we turn, our, when we turn back to him. We don't need to try and earn it. We don't need to try to, you know, keep begging him, oh, Lord, I want to make up for what I've done. This is just terrible what I've done. He said, I know you feel bad now that you see the gravity of, of your sin, how far off track. I know you guys are feeling horrible, but the scriptures are full of hope for those who turn to God for forgiveness and put their trust in him. This is a very important day. This is a holy day because we're not just rebuilding walls. We're reestablishing our hearts in the bedrock of God's word. God is, is back among us, and you've repented. Look at you. You're on your, your, your knees. You're crying out for mercy. You're, you're back in relationship with God. He's at work among us. Nehemiah 8.12 says, so the people went away to eat and drink at a festive meal to share gifts of food and to celebrate with great joy because here it is, they had heard God's word and understood them, God's words. Holy Spirit has taken the, God's supernatural word and given them a revelation of the true and living God. And for the next three weeks, they celebrate with great joy. Basically, experience a revival here. God is back in the picture. They're reconnecting with him. The joy of the Lord is their strength. Suddenly, they're not just hearing the law, you know, explain, exposing why they ended up in so much trouble. These are now words of life to them. They're learning that it's not their joy they're experiencing. This new source of strength is the joy of the Lord. It's a gift. Now, here's the great news about that. 
Since God never has a bad day, it doesn't matter whether you've had one or not. You know, his joy is undiminished. And going into the dark days of winter, that's real good news for me, you know, because I don't like dark days and gloom. But the, the, the fact is, you know, I can say with David in Psalm 118, 24, he's, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We can re- really experience the joy of the Lord even when things are gloomy, even when things are still dark. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. That means even if you have walked away from God, even if you have sinned big time for a long time, even if you have made a total mess of everything God has given you, you can still repent and let God forgive you and embrace you, let him wash away your sin and give you power to live a supernatural life that he promises to those who belong to him. Let him set you free from everything that's holding you captive right now, from every lie that's dominating your, 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 your mind. Let God rejoice over you. Remember, God loves you with an everlasting love that is so profound, it's in his only son to a cross to die in your place. He wants you to know it is not a duty to forgive you. It's his delight to receive and restore you. It's not like God goes, oh, you again? One more time. No, never, never with God. God delights in forgiving you. He delights in receiving you. He delights in showing mercy on you. Is that, that is just so backwards. Lord, I don't think that way. That's why he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Don't ever compare me to you. Don't ever compare me to you. That's, that's been your problem. You come to me as though I'm you. I'm not you. I delight in showing mercy. I delight in forgiving you. I delight in receiving you. I delight in loving you. Let me read it to you again. Isaiah 43, 25. God says, I, yes, I alone will blot out your sins because you were so pathetic and you, you made me feel sorry for you. And what, that isn't what it says, is it? Because you did so much penance, you know. I mean, I, I just felt like I was obligated. I'm the one who bought such a sin. Because, you know, Jesus died on the cross. Now, what else am I going to do? No. But that's what we think. I am he who blots out your sins for my own sake and will never think of them again. Man. That is the best news. God, help us believe it, right? Help us believe it. When you finally realize how passionately God loves you and understand that this is not your joy he wants you in, to encounter, this is his joy. He want, God wants us to indulge in it and to bask in it and wallow in it, luxuriate in it, rejoice. I tried to find every adjective I could find. He wants you to participate in this joy he's feeling toward you. He wants you to get into it. I mean, he wants you to enjoy him enjoying you. I have a cat. I just love this cat. I, I, I just, I, and, and really, I, I was not a cat guy. I was a dog guy, all right? I just want you to know. This is, but this is different. Because I've had other cats, and they're just kind of strange. And see, I just made all the cat people mad. But anyway, this cat is different. This is a dog cat. I don't know. (laughs) Tyler is just this crazy animal. I mean, this morning, I'm I'm wandering this little path that I, and he would, he jumped, he will run ahead of me for like five times and look up at me. You're not going to pass me, right? (laughs) You're going to pet me. You're going to pet me, right? You're going to pet me. So I pick him up and I turn him upside down and rub his belly, you know, and scratch his neck and oh, he goes Oh, heaven, you know, I mean, it's just crazy. Body language, facial expression, per motor on full bore, you know. He's just saying, I love you loving me. I can talk to this cat, and he will talk back to me. It's like ridiculous. And I'm looking at Tyler, and and God is going, why don't you do this? See, I'm I'm like one of those cats that goes, "Eh, God, don't, 
no, not there. No, don't rub me there. You know? You know what I'm saying? I was, eh. Don't rub me that way. I, no, I don't like that. I don't deserve this. I, I don't, I, you, shouldn't, I, you shouldn't smile at me right now, Lord. I was going, come on. Get over it. Just, just, just bask in this. Just bask in it. I just love you, boy. <laughs> oh, I just think, God, if we could get over all of our religion, all the ways we've looked at you and see you as this God who just sings songs over us. We were made for this. This is not optional. We have to have this strength of feeling enjoyed in the face of what is coming at us and what's happening in the culture right now. This is going to be a, a depressing decade if we don't begin to encounter the joy of the Lord. You know it. I mean, how are we going to face this? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take the trap. We're going we're to numb out with stuff and entertainment. And the Lord is saying, no, I've got something so much better. I want you to encounter my joy. Because the only way out of this ditch of sin and addiction that so many of us are caught in is experiencing this. God made us to encounter the ecstasy of his presence, to be a happy people who know how to laugh and live in the moment with God and enjoy God. I watched a movie the other night called Risen. Any of you guys saw it, seen that? It was a good movie, wasn't it? It was Jesus after the resurrection. And he's just a normal, you know, it's kind of a normal picture of Jesus in, in the flesh, you know, after he's resurrected. And it's just, oh, wow. It just was like, he's still Jesus, you know. He's still talking to them, you know, and roughing up their hair kind of thing. This is what we're praying for in the S of the trust prayer list. Every day we're asking God for the strength that comes from experiencing his joy. Holy Spirit, rise up in me. Strengthen my mind, my will, my emotions. You know, thank you for the presence of your joy, your patience, your peace, your, joy, your self-control. Fellowship prayers also help us stay connected and strengthen our inner man. Okay, so I know that, you know, the big question here is how, how, how do we enter into God's presence and experience his joy? The Bible says it's a matter of our will. We have to choose it. Here's how David expresses that in Psalm 9, verse 2. He said, I'll come before you with joy. I will rejoice in you and be glad. Psalm 18, 1, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. This is a determination of my will. I choose to rejoice and be glad. Song of Solomon. Uh, David's son Solomon wrote this one. He, in Psalm 1, uh, Psalm 1 Verse 4, he said, I will rejoice and delight in you. I will praise your love more than why. And we even left a blank there for you to fill in one of your favorite pleasures, like texting or TV or Xbox, football, whatever. Psalm 100 is probably the clearest understanding of how we're to approach God in the Bible. Look at this. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Not just all you lands. Do that, Ron. You do that. I, I will serve the Lord with gladness. I will come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us. And not we ourselves. We're his people, the sheep of his pastor. I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving and come into his courts with praise. I will be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Psalm 126, 2, David said, I will sing for joy. What amazing things you have done for me. Yes, Lord, the Lord has done amazing things for me. What joy. Jesus said, I've got a river of living water flowing inside of me. And these verses remind me of my role in releasing them. I have to rejoice in the Lord. Uh, Paul says that in Philippians 4, 4. He says, we're to rejoice in the Lord how often? Always. And again, I say rejoice two times there. You know, it must be important. I was reading the biography of the great evangelist of the last century, Smith Wigglesworth, early, early century. And uh, this guy, mightily used by God, he would make himself dance every morning during his prayer time. Now, I get a little afraid I dislocate a knee at this point, but, you know, Sometimes I'll actually make myself you do a little move, move groove thing, you know, just to say, God, I enter into your gates. You know, I rejoice. I rejoice in you, whether I'm feeling it or not. I mean, that's a huge way to get those rivers flowing. 
Listen to how clear Paul is on this. In Romans 14, 17, he says, you guys have, you've, you've missed the boat here. The kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. It's not ceremonial ritual. It's not blind submission to a bunch of religious rules. He said, the kingdom of God is all about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, let's think about that for a minute. Holy Spirit comes to live in my spirit the moment I'm born again. That's what being born again is. It's, it's having the Holy Spirit rebirth my human spirit. But I need him in my emotions. I need him in my mind. I need him to help me to strengthen my will. I want to experience. I don't want God in a box. I want God flowing through me. I want the rivers of living water. I want to, you know, I have a river of life. Of course, I've never tasted it. I've never touched it. But it's there. The Bible says, I want, I want to taste it. I want to touch it. It's why Paul encourages us in Ephesians 5, 18. He says, be filled with the Spirit. What is he talking about? He's talking about having it affect us, being filled. But the English translation doesn't cut it. The Greek tense of that verb literally means be being filled. So this is ongoing. It's continuously providing us the power, the joy to live the Christian life if we stay connected. The source of our joy is a river of living water that's inside us that we can literally tap and drink from. Now, that's what we've been doing at our prayer meetings. If you want to get a feel for what this is like, come join us. First and third Sunday. This is the fifth Sunday, so it'll be next week. Uh, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, we meet here and... It's been amazing. I mean, that river of joy is always flowing, and we're learning. Even on Thursday, our, our pastoral team has been getting together for prayer, a time of worship, and after some fasting. And it's just amazing. The river of joy is there regardless how we go in there feeling. We were uh, in Africa a couple years ago, and I've told this story, but uh, I wanted to see it, just a little bit of video here we came up on this village. This was one of the villages that actually had a decent road. And, uh, and these people live in abject poverty. They had no music, dirt floors. They live in little one-room houses, and their church is dirt. I mean, we started a procession here from the street. And I mean, they are, they, these people are joy-filled. Uh, they started here, and they, we had a joy parade all the way into the main part of the village where the little uh, church was. And once we got inside there, we had church. I mean, these guys were in the spirit. They, they were, they caught, we got caught up with them. We're standing there on the side and we're being blown away. I mean, with nothing but hand drums, you know, that's their only music. And I remember watching these little boys, you've seen them there, and girls, uh, just dancing before, and what you can't see is just tears, just stream, tears of joy, just streaming down their faces. And I am thinking, I am wiped out. I'm looking over at Karis and going, what, what is wrong with us? You know, pure joy that they're encountering. And I'm thinking, you know what it is? We don't turn to God and seek Him with the kind of desperation these people do. I mean, they, they come to God with their whole heart. I mean, they are all out in their worship. They, you know, we don't really expect anything in worship. It's like, oh, well, that's nice. Good job. You know, we, we, we never turn off our cell phone. We never turn off the running conversation. We had, I think this is another church. Yeah, this is another congregation. It was, oh, gosh. Talk about a destitute area. I, I can't even describe to you what these people live in and what they're surrounded by. Now God wants us to enter his gates with thanksgiving, come into his courts with praise, be thankful to him so we can encounter this. These people are so desperate for God. No, not only do they live in a war zone that, and have for the, uh, the past decade or more, they have seen family members die of malaria, snake bites, every condition imaginable. They've had their children kidnapped and killed by witch doctors, sacrificing them to evil spirits. I mean, they live in such a hostile place. In that last church, I mean, they had lost so many of their children uh, to malaria. But they have learned to turn to God with all they've got. I mean, we had a couple, in, well, more than a couple. It seemed like every little place we went into, uh, the, there were a group of ladies at the end who wanted to pray for Debbie and me. 
I want to tell you, I've been prayed for by some pretty notable people in the last 40 years. I have never been prayed for like this. I have never experienced that kind of prayer. Debbie said the same. We were in tears. We were melted by the way these people know God, the power that's on their lives, the joy they know in God, and it has nothing to do with their circumstances. And think, In fact, I think uh, other than it's made them desperate to know and encounter this joy, and, and that's, you know, what I'm praying that God will do for us. In Psalm 138, 1, David said, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise to thee. I mean, David goes at this full out. I think that's why he encountered God the way he did. In Jeremiah 29, 13, God said, you will seek me and find me when? You search for me with all your heart. I will be found of you, says the Lord. You know what we've been praying for more than anything? God, give us holy desperation. Don't get us to the place that, you know, the whole country unravels and we'll have to all be, you know, seeking. Do it now. Do it in our hearts now. That's what's going to connect our hearts to God. That's what's going to pull us out of this mesmerized, dazed, confused, half-hearted approach we've taken to prayer and worship. James 4, uh, 5, 16 says it's the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person that's effective. And I always thought of fervent as, but it's not loud. Focus, focus, fervent prayer is just, it's intense. You know, the difference between a laser and a normal light bulb is focus. A laser can cut through steel. And this is why you want to set aside time to get here for a prayer meeting where all the, your devices get turned off and set aside and, you know, and we shift channels. Because if we want things to change in our hearts and our country, this is where we need to be putting our energy. Not engaging in a yelling match and name calling and all the stuff that's going on right now outside the church. You know, God could intervene and do something that would totally change everything, but it will only happen if he, we do what he tells us to do. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, it's Joel 2, cry out for mercy, engage in seeking him with our whole hearts. You know, come join us Wednesday night for communion. We're going to, we're going to put some of this into, into practice right here in the main room. I even... Told the team, get ready. I'm going to get with you guys and worship this week because I just want, I want us to encounter God. In fact, I want to end this service with that. But, uh, but first, I want to invite those of you who have never asked Jesus to take control of your life to do that. And uh, you can do it right now. In fact, I want you to just, bow, just close your head, eyes. You don't even have to bow your head, but just so you're focused. Right now, if this is the beginner's prayer. This is where you start. You start by just saying, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. You just say that in your heart to God for right now. I believe that you became a human so that you could die for my sins, so that I could have a relationship with you. Come into my life. I'm inviting you to be the Lord of my life. I surrender to you. And Holy Spirit, I welcome you. Come. And take control of my life. I give it to you. I surrender. I lead me into all that you have for me. I want to know your love. I want to encounter this love and joy the Bible talks about, that Jesus talks about. Make it real to me. Now, Father, I'm asking you to do that for every one of us. Encounter us today with your love, with your joy, 